morning, everyone. What a wonderful time of praise. I just want to thank the Lord for the worship team and all the hard work that goes into putting just a time of praise and worship together, picking the songs and the scriptures that we recite together. We're in the book of uh, Zephaniah, um, a book that I treasure, I truly treasure and go back to often, and I'll, I'll let you know why in just a second. We're in Zephaniah chapter three. But I will leave among you a humble and lovely, lowly people, and they will take refuge in the name of the Lord. The remnant of Israel will do no wrong, tell no lies, nor will deceitful tongue be found in their mouths, for they will feed, feed and lie down with no one to make them tremble. Shout for joy, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O Israel. Rejoice and exalt with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away his judgment against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The Lord of Israel, the Lord is in your midst. You will fear disaster no more. In that day, it will be said to Jerusalem, do not be afraid, O Zion. Do not let your hands fall limp. The Lord your God is in your midst, a victorious warrior. He will exalt over you with joy. He will be quiet in his love. He will rejoice over you with shouts of joy. I will gather those who grieve about the appointed feasts. They came from you, O Zion. The reproach of exile is a burden on them. Behold, I'm going to deal at that time with all your oppressors. I will save the lame and gather the outcast, and I will turn their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. At that time, I will bring you in. Even at that time when I gather you together, indeed, I will give you renown and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. Let's pray. Lord and our God, we love you and praise you and just are so grateful and thankful for your holy word. We ask you now, Lord, to do your holy work within us from this wonderful prophet of the Old Testament. Let it come to life in our hearts, Lord, and spill over to our walk with you and draw us near to you. May it be so in Jesus' name. I, I do love the book of uh, Zephaniah. Um, this is a, a, a book that literally changed my perspective on God. See, I knew the God of my salvation. I knew the God of creation, and I knew the God of all power and of all judgment who would deal with my sin. But when I was introduced to Zephaniah 317 in particular, the Bible and the Holy Spirit introduced me to the God of all creation who takes delight in me and rejoices over me. And that was a profound perspective, 180 degrees different from what I had ever seen God before when I first came across Zephaniah. Uh, Zephaniah, like so many prophets we know, is imploring the people, he's challenging the people to turn back, turn back to God, but not just for obedience. I mean, to me, that's like reading the parable of the talents and only focusing on this verse. You remember the parable of the talents, they came back often, and then the master would say, well done, good and faithful servant said that several times until the last one. But you know what else that person said? Enter into the joy of your master. That's what Zephaniah is saying. Enter into the joy. When we step out into obedience, not in our own eyes, our hearts, our minds, not out of guilt and fear, but when we do what is right in the Lord, the Lord takes delight in us. It's one of the greatest blessings we can know is to feel that God is exalting over us with gladness and joy. He will rejoice over you with shouts of joy, Zephaniah 17 says. That's what I'd like to share with you this morning because that's what I want in my life. I think that's what many believers want in their life. Can you hear God exalting over you with loud singing and shouts of joy? Let's take a look at Zephaniah real quick. Now, Zephaniah delivered God's word during the reign of King Josiah, a good king. And this was 20 years before they were taken into captivity. And Josiah is the one who found the lost book of the law in the temple and wanted to reform the people. He was the one, Josiah, who tore down the idols because the people really had drifted so far away from God. And like so many of the prophets of the day, 
we find Zephaniah announcing clearly and loudly that judgment of the Lord is coming. He tells the people, these are the words of the Lord most high. I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. The great day of the Lord is near, near and coming quickly. Listen, the cry on that day of the Lord will be bitter. He's talking about judgment. Judgment was coming. But at the same time, he's not only talking about judgment, he's calling them to return. In Zephaniah 2.3, he's urging the people to return to him. Seek the Lord, seek the Lord, all you humble of the land. Who do, who do his commands, seek righteousness, seek humility. That is, you know, see, Zephaniah is saying to them, obedience to that command is what he's wanting. He's warning them of the dire consequences. This is where most people think Zephaniah kind of ends, right here. This is the verse that captures Zephaniah. I would say, I think Zephaniah is calling us deeper to hear God's voice. Not, not just obedience, which is wonderful. We, we want to follow that. I see Zephaniah also calling his people to hear God's voice. Yes, to move to repentance and, and obedience, but only if we can taste and see the rewards that God wants to offer us. Hebrews eleven six is a wonderful verse. It's a wonderful verse. You know, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Those who approach God need to believe that he exists and that he's a rewarder of those who earnestly seek him. God is a rewarder of those who earnestly seek him. But like the people in Zephaniah's day, we get so wrapped up in ourselves, pride and idols and all these things, and they're pressing in on us. And in fact, Zephaniah said the same thing in chapter 2, verses 13 through 15. He says, the Philistines are to our east. Moab is to the west, the Ethiopians are to the south, and Assyria is to the north. He's telling them we are being pressed in by all sides. And he's feeling the pressure, and the people are imploding. They're robbing themselves of the blessings of the Lord because they cannot hear his voice. Look, we know what God wants from us. He wants us to love him with all our heart, soul, and strength. And yet at the same time, the world is pressing in. I'm filled with sin. I'm prone to wander. But the God of this universe and of all creation is still singing over us. He's rejoicing over our goodness in him. And Jeremiah 32, 41 says, I will rejoice in doing them good with all of his heart and with all of his soul. That's a wonderful thing to hold on to. We are to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, and strength, and then to know that he's rejoicing over us and doing us good with all of his heart and with all of his soul. But unfortunately, we, just like the people in Zephaniah's day, we cannot hear God's voice. We don't understand this rejoicing. We don't feel this rejoicing from all the pressing in. So I want to give you three things to focus on, especially in this day and age where people just are crying out for help and support and trying to find their way. I want to give us three things to look at. These are three reasons why we do not hear the King of Glory shouting over us and rejoicing us today. Here's the first one. It's simply guilt. I think guilt, I talk about this a lot. I've studied this a lot. Guilt, guilt is such a powerful emotion that manifests itself deeper and deeper to disabling existence because guilt counters worry, which also counters our faith. It is difficult to have worry, as I talked about last time, and have faith at the same time. In fact, it's that seesaw we looked at last month. We feel guilty about our prayer life as believers. We feel guilty about our time in God's word. It just surrounds us. It can be paralyzing. And I think this is what was going on in Zephaniah's day. He's calling them and telling them judgment is coming and they just, they're paralyzed. It gets to the point where we say things like, I don't pray enough. I don't spend enough time in God's word. I, I feel so bad about that. But friends, I don't wanna discount prayer or time in God's word, but we'll never know what's enough. We'll never know what's enough because we don't do these things to check a box and not feel guilty. We do these things to hear God's voice. 
I want to read God's word to hear his voice. I want to pray to God to commune with him and to hear God speaking to me through the power of his spirit. So if we can move in these directions that Zephaniah is calling us to, he's telling the people, I, I will purify the lips of the people. I will purify the lips of the people. If he's going to purify the lips, he's going to purify the heart because what comes out of the heart is, is evil. We've got to work with God here and let him purify our heart and purify our lips and help us to deal with this guilt that just forsakes us. So we need to really focus on three things when we talk about guilt. Focus less on what we've done wrong. Focus more on what he's done for us, the gifts that he's offering us. We need to accept that in Christ, we are forgiven and stop focusing on all these things that we do before him to be accepted. Focus on, we are already forgiven. He, he has given us the righteousness of God in Christ. Therefore, we don't need to worry about performance. We need to begin studying him to know him, not so that he knows we read God's word. He knows, but let's study God's word so that we know him deeper. Let's pray so that we are counting on him, not that we can count the day that we prayed. And finally, we need to forget how far we fall short and simply remember how far we've come by his mercy and grace. When we put these things together, we can start to hear God shouting over us. But if we're focused only on guilt of what we've done wrong, we, we kind of get into that paralyzed state that the people in Zephaniah's day were. They were not moving closer to God. They were really running away from God. And, and sin compounded sin. And that's why Zephaniah was crying, judgment is coming. We need to let go of guilt to hear him singing and rejoicing over us. The second reason that we can't hear God's voice rejoicing over us with gladness and goodness is because of just distance. God doesn't feel close to me anymore, we might say. And in, especially in Zephaniah's day with people pressing in, they felt that God was, you know, where was God? Why isn't he helping us? We're surrounded by our enemies. But here's what verse 15 and 17 say. The king of Israel, the Lord your God, is in your midst. That's a verse you can share with anybody, anytime, any circumstance. It, it, as sad as the situation might be, I, I had to go visit a friend in hospice the other day. I shared that, you know, the Lord of all creation is here with us now. At a wedding, God is with us now. He is the three cords that cannot be broken. This, this is what we always have to remember. God is here. He's in the midst. Yahweh, I know you are here. He is not far. And the great promise of his word is we draw near to him. He draws near to you. To hear the Lord exult over us with loud singing and joy means we have to acknowledge him. We, we cannot ignore him as we sometimes do, and, and especially Zephaniah and, and those, the people of his day, they were ignoring God. It's, it's like marriage, and, and we know if you've been married or you look to marriage, we know one of the most important components of marriage is communication and listening to each other. It takes, it takes a few years to get used to that and understand it. You, you, it's, it's not that I can hear each other's voice, right? Yeah, I can hear you and I'm working on the computer. Yeah, I know, I heard what you said. I'm walking out of the room. No, no. What, what, what each other wants is attention, eye contact. I want to know your presence in this conversation. Not, that, not just, oh, I can hear you. I think the same holds true with God. Zephaniah and all the prophets, and all the evidence that they saw. They speak of judgment was coming, but there's also reconciliation coming. Zephaniah says, I will save the lame and gather the outcasts and turn their shame into praise. So we need to move in these directions. Acknowledge that he exists. Acknowledge him in all your ways. And then your heart begins to long for him and watch him work in your life. It's, it's more than outward appearance that the Lord wants. He wants the heart. He wants the mind. He wants our lives to be radically changed. Now, 
if you've been in this loving relationships before, you, you know what the other individual wants is for you to be quiet together. And the Lord wants us to be quiet with him, spending time with him, allowing his voice to be heard without all distractions. I, I, kind of, I look at it sometimes as you've either seen it in the movies or you've seen it in a room yourself where maybe you've called somebody else across the room and you watched them pick up their phone and go, eh, no. I, yeah, you've seen it. I see it we, all the time. It, it, that's hurtful, right? I, I think that's sometimes how we are with the Lord. We're doing something and we feel God through the presence of the spirit call us and, and we just go, no. We just put our, as if he, he's not gonna know that I, I knew he was calling me. No, I, he knows he's, he's, he's trying to get us to come back to him. He's trying to speak into our heart, but we, we ignore him because we're too focused on the distractions of life, playing solitaire on our phone, retirement portfolios, all the busyness of life. Our prayer time, our quiet time, our devotional time reveals one thing. How close are you to the Lord? How much do we care about building that relationship? Is it becoming more and more intimate? Because it's not a matter of just being in the same room. It's not a matter of proximity. It's a matter of intimacy and care. The old familiar saying is true. If you do not feel close to God, guess who moved? Not God. We need to draw near to him and he will draw near to us. So we fail to hear God singing and exalting over us. We, we fail to hear his gladness and goodness in, in us because sometimes we just are plagued with guilt and we get paralyzed. And, and sometimes it's simply because we're not drawing near to him. The third reason is simply bondage. It's I'm shackled by sin and those things that have a stronghold in my life. And Zephaniah understood this very well. After delivering the word of judgment, he wrote this in verse 7, but there will they were still eager to act corruptly in all their deeds. The, the people were, were shackled by sin and bondage. After hearing judgment was coming, they said, ah, that's okay. And they were just continuing to act corruptly in all their deeds. I think we act like that too sometimes. Zephaniah is spelling out plainly the devastation and destruction of the Lord is coming. It is coming. They needed to humble themselves, repent, and turn back to God. So in verse 8, God says this, Therefore wait for me, declares the Lord, for the days when I rise up as a witness. Indeed, my decision is to gather nations, to assemble kingdoms, to pour on, out on them my indignation, all my burning anger, for all the earth will be devoured by the fire of my zeal. Whew. That's hard to read. This is the word of God to the people. But then in verse 12, he offers this. He gives them hope. This is the God who wants to rejoice over us for gladness. He gives them hope. And he says, but I will leave among you a humble and lowly people, and they will take refuge in the name of the Lord. This is what we have to remember, that God's plan is restoration, taking broken vessels like us and restoring us for his purpose by his heart. Even though the people of that day were gripped by sin, God's plan of salvation before the foundation of the earth was to restore them. And that's the same hope for us. We go further and we look at uh, Zephaniah 315, he says, he has cleared away your enemies. Well, that's a wonderful, wonderful promise that God will clear away our enemies. The New Testament says he will make an escape for us when we're tempted. Zephaniah 317a says, the Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who saves. And that's a foreshadowing of the gospel, right? A mighty one who saves. 317 says, he will quiet you by his love. Some translations say, be silent in his love over you. This verse is such a treasure because it literally is speaking to, even though we are shackled by sin 
and, and we do things we ought not to do, even though we don't want to do them sometimes, the Lord is saying to us, I will not hold your sins against you. I will be quiet over you by love because your sins have been placed on my son. He's not going to assail you with accusations of guilt. He's going to quiet you by his love, by his forgiveness. Be silent in his love over you. If we could receive that promise, that promise right there, we would be in a position to hear God rejoice over us with gladness, with joy, exultation, shouts of joy, singing. And that's the verse that captured me in all of Zephaniah that continues 20 years later, still studying this book. The words haven't changed. I'd have. But to know that the Lord of all creation shouts over me with joy and exultation is it's almost too much to take in. If we want to hear the Lord sing, and I do, and I know you do too, we need to put ourselves in that position. Here's three things that we can do, three things in 60 seconds we can do to position ourselves to hear God rejoice over us. One, serve and love other people. It's that simple. Guilt is a way of festering in a stagnant mind and body. If I am isolated by myself, not around other people, guilt builds up. But when I'm serving and loving other people, guilt has a way of being diminished. Two, we have to be vigilant in identifying the idols in our life, those things that grip our heart and steal away the joy of Christ. And we all have them. We're all drawn to them. We're all prone to wander. Uh, Jonah 2.8 says, those who cling to worship, uh, worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. Forfeit what? Forfeit the, the Lord singing over you and rejoicing you. You forfeit that when you cling to worthless idols. And the last one is return. Just simply do what Ze Ze Zephaniah and all the prophets said, return to God. And here's the promise from God. You can read about this in Jeremiah. The Lord said, if you return to me, Jeremiah, I will restore you. I will separate the precious from the worthless, and I will restore you to your calling. That's the three things we need to do to position ourselves to hear the Lord shouting over us. In closing, I think Je Zephaniah's charge was really simple. He was called to change the people's perspective, to point the people to the Lord, yes, to repent and obey, we know that, but also so that they could quiet their hearts and hear his voice and draw near. I've shared this many times because I love my wife and you know, marriage is, is a challenge. I think it's a challenge that we are to grow together in the Lord. Um, I've shared this in, in this way that this is my wife's I, picture of an ideal marriage. This is in our kitchen. I gave this to her for Christmas. It's just a simple thing I printed off the internet. And it says, my beloved is mine. So it's not a, it's, it's older people too. I mean, maybe my age at this point, but they're older people. It's not this uh, passionate youthful embrace and nothing like that. She said, this is my image of an ideal marriage. And here's, here's why. And it took time to understand this because I thought, well, I can wash dishes. I can do that. Check, check, check. I can do that. No, it simply was, she said, I, I want you to be there next to me because you desire to be with me. You desire to be close to me more than you desire to be anywhere else. Wow. And here's, here's why. Because this is when my joy in you is the highest, she said, when I know you want to be with me. Whew. Okay, that makes sense. It's not the dishes. That's a mundane task. <laughs> we all probably don't like. But to desire to be next to her, that's what she wants. And I think that's what Zephaniah is saying to the people. The Lord wants us to take great delight in him so that he can take great delight in us. So that he can quiet you by his love and rejoice over you with shouts of joy and loud singing. As the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, we shall 
so shall your God rejoice over you. Amen. Lord God, we, we just love you and we thank you, Lord, for all the promises we hold in you and your son, our savior, Jesus Christ. We, it is too much to take in, Lord, that you would just be over us with gladness and joy and shouts of joy, Lord. It's too much to take in, but we, we take it, we believe it, Lord, because it's in your precious word that you take delight in us. But help us, Lord, to take even greater delight in you and to draw near to you by the power of your word and the promises of your spirit. In Jesus' name.